Hi BookTube, welcome back to the BookTube Prize channel. My name is Robert and today I'm going to introduce six new books that have been submitted for next year's BookTube Prize in the nonfiction division. The first book is called The Light of Days, The Untold Story of Women Resistance Fighters in Hitler's Ghettos by Judy Battalion. Witnesses to the brutal murder of their families and the violent destruction of their communities, a cadre of Jewish women in Poland, some still in their teens, became the nerves of a wide-ranging resistance network that fought the Nazis. With courage, guile, and nerves of steel, these ghetto girls smuggled guns in loaves of bread and coded intelligence messages in their braids. They helped build life-saving systems of underground bunkers and sustained thousands of Jews in safe hiding places. They bribed Gestapo guards with liquor, assassinated Nazis, and sabotaged German supply lines. The Light of Days at last reveals the real history of these incredible women whose courageous yet little-known feats have been eclipsed by time. Judy Battalion, the granddaughter of Polish Holocaust survivors, follows these real-life heroines through the savage destruction of the ghettos, arrest and internment in Gestapo prisons and concentration camps, and for a lucky few, through the end of the war and into the 21st century. Powerful and inspiring, The Light of Days is an unforgettable true tale of exceptional bravery, female friendship, and survival in the face of staggering odds. The second book is called Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty by Patrick Radden Keefe. The Sackler name adorns the walls of many storied institutions, Harvard, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Oxford, the Louvre. They are one of the richest families in the world, known for their lavish donations to the arts and the sciences. The source of the family fortune was vague, however, until it emerged that the Sacklers were responsible for making and marketing a blockbuster painkiller that was the catalyst for the opioid crisis. Empire of Pain begins with the story of three doctor brothers, Raymond, Mortimer, and the incalculably energetic Arthur, who weathered the poverty of the Great Depression and appalling anti-Semitism. Working at a barbaric mental institution, Arthur saw a better way and conducted groundbreaking research into drug treatments. He also had a genius for marketing, especially for pharmaceuticals, and bought a small ad firm. Arthur devised the marketing for Valium and built the first great Sackler fortune. He purchased a drug manufacturer, Purdue Frederick, which would be run by Raymond and Mortimer. The brothers began collecting art and wives and grand residences in exotic locales. Their children and grandchildren grew up in luxury. Forty years later, Raymond's son Richard ran the family-owned Purdue. The template Arthur Sackler created to sell Valium, co-opting doctors, influencing the FDA, downplaying the drug's addictiveness, was employed to launch a far more potent product, OxyContin. The drug went on to generate some $35 billion in revenue and to launch a public health crisis in which hundreds of thousands would die. This is the saga of three generations of a single family and the mark they would leave on the world, a tale that moves from the bustling streets of early 20th century Brooklyn to the seaside palaces of Greenwich, Connecticut and Cap Dantibes to the corridors of power in Washington, D.C. Empire of Pain chronicles the multiple investigations of the Sacklers and their company and the scorched earth legal tactics that the family has used to evade accountability. The history of the Sackler dynasty is rife with drama, Baroque personal lives, bitter disputes over estates, fistfights in boardrooms, glittering art collections, Machiavellian courtroom maneuvers, and the calculated use of money to burnish reputations and crush the less powerful. Empire of Pain is a masterpiece of narrative reporting and writing, exhaustively documented and ferociously compelling. It's a portrait of the excesses of America's second Gilded Age, 
a study of impunity among the super elite and a relentless investigation of the naked greed and indifference to human suffering that built one of the world's great fortunes. The third book is called The Man Who Hated Women, Sex, Censorship, and Civil Liberties in the Gilded Age by Amy Sohn. Anthony Comstock, special agent to the U.S. Post Office, was one of the most important men in the lives of 19th century women. His eponymous law, passed in 1873, penalized the mailing of contraceptives and obscene materials with steep fines and long sentences. The word comstockery came to connote repression and prudery. Between 1873 and Comstock's death in 1915, eight remarkable women were charged with violating state and federal Comstock laws. These sex radicals supported contraception, sexual education, gender equality, and women's right to pleasure. They took on the fearsome censor in explicit personal writing, seeking to redefine work, family, marriage, and love for a bold new era. In The Man Who Hated Women, Amy Sohn tells the overlooked story of their valiant attempts to fight Comstock in court and in the press. They were publishers, writers, and doctors, and they included the first woman presidential candidate, Victoria C. Woodhull, the virgin sexologist, Ida C. Craddock, and the anarchist, Emma Goldman. In their willingness to oppose a monomaniac who viewed reproductive rights as a threat to the American family, the sex radicals paved the way for second wave feminism. Risking imprisonment and death, they redefined birth control access as a civil liberty. The Man Who Hated Women brings these women's stories to vivid life, recounting their personal and romantic travails alongside their political battles. Without them, there would be no pill, no planned parenthood, no Roe versus Wade. This is the forgotten history of the women who waged war for the right to control their bodies. The fourth book is The Case of the Murderous Dr. Cream, The Hunt for a Victorian-Era Serial Killer by Dean Job. When a doctor does go wrong, he's the first of criminals, Sherlock Holmes observed during one of his most baffling investigations. He has nerve and he has knowledge. In the span of 15 years, Dr. Thomas Neal Cream murdered as many as 10 people in the United States, Britain, and Canada, making him one of the most prolific killers of his time. Poison was his weapon of choice. Largely forgotten today, this villain was as brazen as the notorious Jack the Ripper. Structured around his London murder trial in 1892, when he was finally brought to justice, the case of the murderous Dr. Cream exposes the blind trust given to medical practitioners, as well as the flawed detection methods, bungled investigations, corrupt officials, and stifling morality of Victorian society that allowed Dr. Cream to prey on vulnerable and desperate women, many of whom had turned to him for medical help. Dean Job transports readers to the late 19th century as Scotland Yard tracks Dr. Cream's movements through Canada and Chicago, and finally to London, where new investigative tools called forensics were just coming into use, and most investigators could hardly imagine that serial killers existed. The term was unknown. As the Chicago Tribune wrote, Dr. Cream's crimes marked the emergence of a new breed of killer, one who operated without motive or remorse, who murdered simply for the sake of murder. The case of the murderous Dr. Cream is an unforgettable true crime story by a master of the genre. The fifth book is called Don't Call It a Cult, The Shocking Story of Keith Ranieri and the Women of Nexium by Sarah Berman. Sex trafficking, self-help coaching, forced labor, mentorship, multi-level marketing, gaslighting, Investigative journalist Sarah Berman explores the shocking practices of Nexium, an organization run by Keith Ranieri and his high-profile enablers, Seagram heir Claire Bronfman, Smallville actor Allison Mack, Battlestar Galactica actor Nikki Klein. In her deeply researched account, Berman unravels how young women seeking creative coaching and networking opportunities found themselves blackmailed, literally branded, near-starved, and enslaved. 
With the help of the Bronfman fortune, Ranieri built a wall of silence around these abuses, leveraging the legal system to go after enemies and whistleblowers. Don't Call It a Cult shows that these abuses looked very different from the inside, where young women initially received mentorship and protection. Don't Call It a Cult is a riveting account of Nexium's rise to power, its ability to evade prosecution for decades, and the investigation that finally revealed its dark secrets to the world. It explores why so many were drawn to its message of empowerment, yet could not recognize its manipulative and harmful leader for what he was, a criminal. And the sixth book is called American Republics, A Continental History of the United States, 1783 to 1850 by Alan Taylor. In this beautifully written history of America's formative period, a preeminent historian upends the traditional story of a young nation confidently marching to its continent's spanning destiny. The newly constituted United States actually emerged as a fragile, internally divided union of states, contending still with European empires and other independent republics on the North American continent. Native peoples sought to defend their homelands from the flood of American settlers through strategic alliances with the other continental powers. The system of American slavery grew increasingly powerful and expansive, its vigorous internal trade in black Americans separating parents and children, husbands and wives. Bitter party divisions pitted elites favoring strong government against those like Andrew Jackson espousing a democratic populism for white men. Violence was both routine and organized. The United States invaded Canada, Florida, Texas, and much of Mexico, and forcibly removed most of the native peoples living east of the Mississippi. At the end of the period, the United States, its conquered territory reaching the Pacific, remained internally divided, with sectional animosities over slavery growing more intense. Alan Taylor's elegant history of this tumultuous period offers indelible miniatures of key characters from Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth to Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Margaret Fuller. It captures the high-stakes political drama as Jackson and Adams, Clay, Calhoun, and Webster contend over slavery, the economy, Indian removal, and national expansion. A ground-level account of American industrialization conveys the everyday lives of factory workers and immigrant families, and the immersive narrative puts us on the streets of Port-au-Prince, Mexico City, Quebec, and the Cherokee capital, New Echota. Absorbing and chilling, American Republics illuminates the continuities between our own social and political divisions and the events of this formative period. Okay, there you have six new entries for next year's Book 2 Prize in the Nonfiction Division. I'll be back soon with another introductory video.